The End of Medicine is the title of a new documentary on the effects of corporate farming that puts profits above all else at the expense of animals, humans, and the world. That means the title, The End of Medicine, is no exaggeration. It's a warning. And there's a witness. What the pig doctor saw. Next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights. Brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, The End of Medicine. A new documentary from director Alex Lockwood looks at what makes corporate agricultural practices bad for the animals, for the people, and for the world. Lockwood gets experts on the record about how the overuse of antibiotics in ag renders therapeutic use in humans less effective, and how the potential for the spread of disease and deadly bird flu in factory farms can be far deadlier than even COVID. But beyond the experts, the key eyewitness is a pig veterinarian, Alex Broff, who in the course of her work became horrified at the conditions for animals, as well as the consequences for the world. Lockwood, who previously directed the documentary Test Subjects about animal experimenters, who gave up vivisection to work full-time for animal rights as scientist at PETA, makes Broth, the now vegan former pig doctor and full-time activist, the film's key messenger. Here's my conversation with Dr. Alice Broth and Alex Lockwood on The PETA Podcast. Alex, you know, I saw test subjects and I could tell this was your movie I you have that you have that visual style already yeah it is yeah I mean I, I'm not aware of of it whilst making it but I guess it's the only sort of style I know how to do so it just <laughs> sort of happens if you know what I mean well it you know the thing is it's your vision but it's helped by the vision of our our guest here also, Alice Broff. I mean, how did you get to meet? And Alice, uh, welcome to the PETA podcast. It, Thank it's, you. <laughs> it's nice to see you. I'm glad I can see you. I thought if you were going to say you were the whistleblower, that I was prevented from saying anything about you other than she she whistles very loudly and Alex noticed. But uh, <laughs> So how is it that no, you got, it. Yeah, how is it that you guys got together? Alex, did you discover her or did her whistle become so loud that you couldn't help but notice her? Yeah, so uh basically we were uh we interviewed somebody for the film and they said you should really speak to Dr. Bra um and told me a bit about Alice's backstory. And so I got in touch with Alice and she was kind enough to say that you know, she wanted to be part of the film, which was great. And uh, we initially conducted a, a, an interview that was about four hours long. And Alice was going to be uh, one of many interviews. But then the more we sort of watched this interview back, the more it became obvious that Alice needed to play a more integral role because um, of everybody who we spoke to. Um, as part of making the film, Alice was the only person who was speaking from a position of coming from the industry that she's now um, critiquing and, and um, that we're talking about rather than being an outsider looking in. And so, yeah, when um, Alice came along and agreed to be in the film to a much more full extent, that was when the film started taking real shape and, and structure, I think. So. so Alice's point of view, it's apparent, I, I've only seen the trailer at this point. I look forward to seeing the entire film, but Alice, you just heard the director producer say that you were the piece in the Jenga puzzle that without you, there would be nothing. It's, I mean, you had the perspective and you're, you're a veterinarian, correct? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say there would be nothing without me. It was already a fully formed uh, piece. It just I say happened that I kind of had pieces to my story that weaved everything together, I think, which, um, yeah, it's great. It's an honour to be part of. Well, it it's such a daunting title, you know, and Alice is the key, but Alex, this idea of the end of medicine 
well, there goes all the cures. There's nothing left for us. I mean, that's pretty dire, Alex, the end of yeah. medicine. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's like a caveat to the title in that it's the end of medicine as we know it. And what the title refers to is um, this idea that the more we use antibiotics in a way in which we shouldn't, the more they um, lose their potency and the further we go down this road of uh, getting towards this place whereby we're just not going to have the life-saving medicines at hand that we have today. And obviously we see antibiotic resistant bacteria already and, and people are dying because of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And um, you have people like Dame Sally Davis, who was the former chief health advisor to the UK government, saying that this is something that she feels could be even more devastating to the human race than than the risk posed by even climate change and so that's kind of what the title alludes to in that sort of dire sense but it also to me means something quite positive in the fact that at the moment we have this reliance on uh, medicine because of our lifestyles because of the way that we consume and a change in medicine as we know it could also be a very positive thing as a result of changing the behaviors that lead to negative health implications so to me the title is um a pessimistic one but also a very optimistic one in tandem if that makes sense yeah you know a lot of people have been talking about uh you know the therapeutic power of medicine if only medicine would notice how therapeutic it can be you know from diet and that sort of thing and then and then you talk about the factory farms and you talk about and i guess that's where the veterinary perspective comes in so, Alice, I can see why, you know, because people have been talking about uh, problems with medicine for a long time and, you know, the antibiotic uh, idea, uh, making it ineffective if there's more antibiotics. But you get that perspective of what it's really like. And yeah. I think I can understand why Alex thought you were the voice. So describe your situation. Where were you in and what kind of things did you see that came that brought you to this conclusion? I spent four years working as a vet specifically for the British pig industry. So I was going around, you know, hundreds of different pig farms uh, on a daily basis um, for those four years. And within that, there was a lot of times that I was prescribing medications, whether that's antibiotics, uh, vaccinations, antiparasitics, that sort of thing. And it was so obvious to me, despite the fact that Britain at the moment has reduced its uh, reliance on antibiotics in livestock and it's lower than a lot of countries, um, we are still massively overusing antibiotics and misusing them as well, just purely because of the way that we're keeping animals on the whole they really need these medicines to survive. And it just so happens that they're the very same medicines that we need to survive. So if we create resistance in farming situations, then we're going to cause huge issues for our own medicine. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I come in on that piece. Really. So, so you were a pig doctor. Yeah, that's it. Pretty much. <laughs> and and you, for the pig industry, which is not insignificant in, in England, I would imagine. Yeah, it's uh, we slaughter about 11 million pigs a year in the UK. 11 um, million? Mm, Would we be better which, off if we slaughtered half that number? I mean, <laughs> we'd be better off, but it wouldn't eliminate the problems. Uh, yeah. You know, seeing these sorts of issues across the board, it didn't really matter whether it was factory farming, which um, undoubtedly has many worse things about it, but I was also seeing disease issues uh, on free range farms and welfare issues on like higher welfare in inverted commas farms. Um, so yeah, it, it's very much my opinion that we absolutely need to eliminate the risk factors entirely. And that would mean not relying on animals for food um, or other uses really. Do you recall that moment when it sort of dawned on you that this thing that you were doing on a repetitive basis, which was curing, you know, uh, you know, using your, veterinary skills to to bring sick pigs back to life and 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 working in the farms did you do you recall a moment when it just dawned on you that something was wrong with everything that you had studied and prepared for professionally and that i got to have a documentary film camera here with me 
to, to make sure that I'm not the only yeah, I really, one. <laughs> yeah, I really wish I'd had a documentary film camera with me the whole time. But um, sadly, I can only talk about my experience and have any cameras on farms. But um, I don't think it was so much uh, like a single moment. It was just, you know, every day I was turning up on farm, I was seeing the same, whether it was like, um horrendous post-weaning diarrhea which occurs because we wean our pigs way too young and we put them in frightening environments stressful environments and they uh, you know invariably develop you know salmonella or e coli diarrhea or something which can be really fatal um so seeing that sort of thing i was seeing um tail biting which is like a behavior a stress behavior um which obviously occurs when we're cramming pigs into small spaces covered in their own feces and uh, with many other pigs that they wouldn't normally be so in close contact with. So, yeah, it's just seeing uh, and lameness everywhere, all these really repetitive issues that were all as a result of the way that we produce them, so they labelled production diseases. And it was always firefighting. So how can we deal with this problem once it's here? Or, um, you know, how can we tweak it slightly so that we can still keep our production up but make it, you know, economically viable um rather than how can we actually prevent these issues in the first place and you know nobody really took a look at the big picture and I think just four years of uh, banging my head against the brick wall trying to kind of say well, why why don't we maybe not wean them at like three weeks of age when in the wild they'd wean at 15 to 18 weeks of age like that's really basic stuff and why don't we not cram them all into such tiny spaces um so yeah it was it was just years of being worn down trying to trying to work out uh why nothing was like obviously changing well is it just because you had a fresher perspective or had new better knowledge or they just had a overweening desire to make money and it came at loggerheads what was it that made you say i'm going to be a good soldier until i can't any longer when, when did you get to that point yeah uh i mean i tried my best within the industry but it's just a case of that at the end of the day in order for them to survive they need to make a profit so it's it's not like they can even consider some of these things really without changing their entire uh, business model or lifestyle um and I think in terms of me being the only one I actually went vegan like halfway through that four years or maybe a little bit before halfway through so I had a good couple of years where I was obviously you know I can't continue to fund this model because a is really traumatic for me and I'm essentially paying to traumatize myself um b it's such a huge risk for disease in humans like there's so many issues um with zoonotic disease that we're just not thinking about until it happens you know it's it's kind of another case of oh when it occurs we'll try and find a vaccine or something like that like we've done with covid it's just that you became vegan in the process of doing your job, which says something. And Alex, you, you hear her story or when you finally get to her after, you know, you're onto this story, you're interviewing all these other people and they say, talk to this, this doctor here, you talk to her. What lights go off in your head when you hear her tell the story of I'm becoming vegan as I'm doing my job. I'm, helping pigs get better, but I'm destroying everything that we know for the future in terms of medicine. What's going off in your head? Well, I'm just thinking that um, people, when they watch a film or they read a book or they hear a presentation, they relate to people faster than they relate to a topic or a fact or a piece of data. And so it's great to have all of those people who can come in and just reel off the data. That's, that's fine. But you also need someone whose story you can connect with. And when you've got somebody saying, you know, I was like the majority of people, but as a result of this process that I've been through, I've changed as a result of it. Um, that's something that I think people can really sort of cling on to and feel like, uh, the information is being given them in such a way that they're not being judged and that they're, there's that point of empathy. So that's sort of what I was thinking when I was listening to Alice talk. And also um, 
sometimes you interview people and um, you can tell they're sort of very rehearsed in what they say and um, they go from point to point and it's great because you get everything in these neat little sound bites and then every so often you interview someone who talks in a way in which is just incredibly sincere and that comes through particularly in a documentary and you just think you know there's a level of storytelling that's required so it's not just um do they fit the bill on paper but also are they this kind of natural storyteller you know there's something about them that i think people can almost immediately relate to and uh, so that's what we sort of saw in alice really so in Al- alice you were kind of like the every woman or the every person in this that 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 must I mean, you were experiencing this that you, I'm sure you wish that everyone else could see so they could also come to the same conclusions, but would they? Uh, what, come to the same conclusions if they saw what I saw? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people would, yes. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's really obvious if you walk onto, you know, say a factory farm, it just smacks you in the face, like the misery of the animals, the stress, um, the smell, the air quality, like it's so obvious why these problems are here and why they're a risk to human health. And then you you go further down and look at like the amount of waste that's coming out of them and see it's so obvious what it's going to do to the environment. You know, um, I would hope that a lot of people would would feel the same but then of course you know I was in the, that job for four years and there are people that have been doing the same job as me for 40 years and uh, are still doing it so I guess it, it depends on your level of conditioning the level of uh, how open you are to change and actually looking at your own behaviors with respect to what impact they might be having on others and, and the planet um so I don't know. I guess I'm a little bit unique in that. And I don't know if anyone else that's come out of the, the industry that I have and is saying the same. But well, well, that's something, though. What does that say? Your co-workers, they, they've seen all these things also for 40 years. It must have made you change your opinion of them as well when they were sort of acting so stoically about the things that they were administering to and what they were creating. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't speak too freely about ex-colleagues or the veterinary profession really um, without getting myself into trouble. Um, but I think, what can I say about that? I, I don't think it changed my opinion because I started off like that. You know, I did come from a very uh, similar background. You know, my grandfather was a livestock farmer and I ate so much meat up until you know, a couple of years into that job. And I think, uh, you know, I'd had it in front of my face for two years before I just was like, well, what am I doing? I can't, what, like, why am I still eating this uh, and buying these products and stuff? So I can't really point the finger at anyone else because I, I've been there. Like, um, I just so happened to <laughs> change my opinion on it, I guess. Right. But this was also your life. As Alex said, it's a part of the story that you were telling and your story as a a young girl growing up in the essentially in the business right yeah um and it's yeah it was a a, oh well I've had a really tough few years because I kind of geared my whole life towards being a vet and I I knew I wanted to go into the pig industry from like age 15 because I I had an experience on a pig farm at that age and then I worked on a pig farm for six months before university so I, I kind of spent all these years and then five years at vet school learning the trade and then specializing for four years uh not specializing but you know like learning specifically about pigs really intensively um so it's a good like you know 13 years of my life that I'd focused solely on uh being a pig vet so it was quite hard I think that's why I stayed so long after I went vegan because I was kind of like I surely can be able to do something good here like influence it from the inside but sadly it's so stuck in that system like there's absolutely no leeway for um big conversations around change and and what we're actually doing um which is why i left and then started speaking about it publicly as, as best i can yeah so either you swallow their story whole or you get eaten whole by the industry pretty much and it's quite um it's quite telling when you look at kind of the 
the vets in the industry, it, there aren't many young vets coming through. Like you tend to go in and then come out after a few years. And a lot of people then go and work in like small animal, you know, dog and cat practice and stuff. Or you stay until you're 70. Like it's kind of one or the other. Um, so you really have to buy into it if you want to keep doing it, I guess. So Alex, you hear Alice's story and you say, boy, this is maybe the vehicle to tell this larger story about what's at stake here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you have that sort of through line that you can then hang on all of those other points and everything just sort of comes together. And, um, and Alice made a really good point then. And we try and touch on that, that sort of cognitive dissonance in the film. And I've talked about it and a few other films as well, where I think um, we look at people who work in this, these industries who are working in animal agriculture and a lot of the time we sort of pit sort of veganism against these people whereby I mean you just heard Alice talking then about how difficult it is to come from that position of always being involved in something and then to one day try and work out okay if I don't do this anymore well what do I do and how do my family react and all of this so I think um We've tried to be really sensitive to that in the film in, a, in such a way that we're not kind of pointing the finger at anyone and saying, oh, aren't these people terrible and um, aren't farmers doing the wrong thing, but more so just trying to, um, you, you, you know, use that word empathy again to try and get people to really connect to Alice's story. And hopefully through Alice, uh, other people who are in a similar position will think, well, if she can do it, so can I. And then particularly for people who, are just looking to sort of change their diet. It's it's an even easier transition because that's that's not the same as changing your whole um, you know career and flipping your life on its head. So hopefully through Alice, a lot of people can feel inspired to make positive changes in their own lives. If that makes sense. Yeah, Alice, do you you started speaking out, but has your life been turned upside down by by? doing so so publicly and so loudly against the industry that you were part of in a word yes <laughs> um uh yeah i mean wh whenever you challenge the status quo there's going to be criticism there's going to be people that really dislike what you're doing and saying because it challenges them and i think you know it it sparks a bit of guilt in people if um if you start questioning things um so yeah I mean I'm a full-time activist now so the last uh three years two years uh I've been doing full-time activism which has taken many different forms and is uh, so far removed from my you know my training and my veterinary work um it's been a real sort of learning curve but so many good opportunities and I you know for me it was I can't you know, I could have just gone and worked as a dog and cat vet, you know, that would have been fine, financially stable to crack on with my life. But uh, there's no way I could just walk away from what I'd seen. Like it was just so awful. I just couldn't, I, I mean, I think of the pigs every day that I've sort of left behind and I just couldn't like not do anything with that. <laughs> but, but it seems like your road to activism was through veterinary, uh, the, the veterinary care industry, I do you often wonder, well, why aren't other veterinarians seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah, um, I actually, interestingly, went to speak to a group of uh, vegan vet students last night and did a talk for them, which was nice because uh, when I was at vet school, I think there was maybe a couple of vegetarians in my year or something like that, a couple of vegans, maybe a few vegetarians. But um, it seems to be getting like more of a thing that's talked about and considered among the profession, although it, it is a, there's a long way to go. It's an interesting one because you, you join the career because you love animals most of the time. That's usually it. You either, you know, either you love animals and you want to help animals or there were quite a few sort of people in my year that were like um, offspring of farmers. So you, you go into the family business almost. So you go in and you really, your whole aim in life is to help animals. And then you get all the training and it's almost a little bit like conditioning, particularly on the farm animal side, because there's no way you can do that job without having to, almost compartmentalize them as other entities and and uh products essentially so um yeah there's quite a lot of conditioning and yeah, alex you, you hear once again alice's story and all right the title the end of medicine we can get people to make the personal change 
to maybe to become vegan or to to issue animal farms but how does how do we get to that that other point of uh you know not using antibiotics as as much and or by creating a new kind of medicine how how do you see that being addressed in yeah it's um it's a difficult one and i think what we're kind of saying with the film um, and Dr. Aisha Akhtar puts it in, the, in, a, in a nice way. She said, if we're going to wait for governments and these big industries and corporations to do the right thing, then we're going to be waiting a long time. Um, and so we now have power ourselves to really, you know, do these positive things and change our habits just by changing what we choose to buy and we're casting a vote with what we buy. And we've got um, an enormous power um, you know, that I think most people don't realize the extent of what happens when just one person decides they're not going to consume animal products. It's got this huge chain reaction, of course, affecting a multitude of issues, whether it be antibiotic resistance, um, climate change, um, you know, uh, social injustice, um, all of these things that t- can draw back in some way to animal farming. And uh, so that's what we're really trying to do with the film is to say, well, look, you know, although it might seem like there are these huge issues and you might feel powerless, you actually do have power as individuals. And the more people realise their power, then governments respond to their voters and these big companies and corporations, the people making the money, if it's hitting them in the pockets because we as individuals are, are, you know, choosing to make positive changes, then it has that positive effect so that's kind of what i'd say to that yeah it seems that the power of the individual and the power of individual responsibility is important but what does it say about the the governing uh class and the business class when they must know this but they continue to do it in spite of knowing that there's a, a smattering of people here who say, Oh, there's something wrong with these farms and a smattering of people here. And it hasn't quite reached that, that critical level where they are forced to act at the governing level and at the business level. What does that say about the leaders in those, those sectors? It must be disheartening somewhat. Yeah. I think it says some very negative things about them in honesty. And, um, we really, really wanted to interview the likes of uh, DEFRA in the United Kingdom, the FDA in the USA. And um, as we kind of predicted, they didn't want to be involved in the film. Um, and uh, we spoke to a politician over here in England about why don't, why doesn't you think that DEFRA, the, you know, um, the governing department for the environment and food and agriculture, why, why doesn't she think that they would want to be a part of this film? And she had, the exact answer that we thought she'd have, which was that they probably wouldn't want to respond to these difficult questions. And there's so much lobbying power. um, There's so much kind of um, paying politicians off. And um, it means that, um, you know, we're really having a lot of our choices controlled by these big agribusinesses who are, who can afford to just sway governments basically. And I think, um, the sooner we kind of stand up and say, well, you know, we're not going to accept that as the voting public and as consumers as well, then the sooner these changes will happen. But yeah, it is, it, it can be very disheartening when you, when you look at it like that. And so I think we've got to kind of remain hopeful that we can, we do have this power as individuals, basically. And to show the story of an individual what better story than a person who is deep into the belly and refuses to eat and comes out of it a vegan and a public speaker like Alice Broff. Alice, that's some responsibility now. You have to convince all the world. <laughs> yeah, I do feel a lot of responsibility, which probably isn't very healthy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I'd love to just say something on that last question as well thinking about climate change and the fact that we've had the science on fossil fuels for like the last 40 years 
And our governments have chosen to continue funding that industry because in turn, they receive so much money from them. You know, uh, new oil fields are being um, signed off in the UK right now. And it's it's just so ludicrous. It's almost like we're at a point where whatever the government's saying, we should do the exact opposite because we know that we can't trust them to do anything other than, uh, you know, whatever's the best for their own wallet. Um, so animal agriculture is the exact same thing. We have all the science on, um, on you know, its effect on climate. Uh, we have all the science on disease and, and antibiotic resistance and they're still funding it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is ridiculous. Well, see, now through the film, it's your face, it's your story. And what is the one thing that you, you if, if people just sort of glance through it and, you know, not that they'd, if they get it, they'll watch it, but they, they may want to fast forward. And what what part would you zero in on and say, you got to see at least this part because this is going to convince you that I'm right and everyone else needs to come along gently, but they need to come along, you know. And look, here in America, we think Europe is far more advanced in terms of these things. And so it's a little disheartening to see that there are some stragglers in Europe too, that are yeah. in line with Americans who are just sort of like, you know, getting, finally getting to it that, Oh, food, you know, food can be therapeutic. Oh, factory farms. They're, they're a problem. So what is that part in the film that you'd say? Oh, you ought to see this part. That's really, that's really hard. I think the whole point of the film is that it links, it makes the link between so many, almost like every issue facing humanity at the moment, you know, uh, environment, disease, uh, medicine, uh, social justice, like, you know, environmental racism and, and all these sort of huge issues facing humanity. And I think the film really ties that in so nicely and then ends with the the crux that we actually have a lot of power over all these issues because they're so interlinked. And that one issue is something that we can actually affect with our own consumer choices, unlike, you know, fossil fuels, for example. But um, Gosh, which part of the film? Yeah, they're, they're, There's a few does. bits that make me cry, which is always good. I think. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> how about the parts that make you cry because it's a personal choice that, you know, there's no going back. It's the existential question. You're forced to answer it. There's no going back. People need to see this before they turn back to the British Bake Off show or something like that. <laughs> but, yeah, I think uh, one bit when I watched the first draft, the one bit that really got me to start, I mean, this is the first bit and then there were loads of others, but um, the uh, head of the Sepsis Trust in the UK, uh, a doctor, um, is asked what antibiotic resistance actually looks like. And I think he says something along the lines of, this looks like your child bumping their knee or your wife getting a simple um infection or chest infection or something like that taking them to hospital and knowing that there's nothing you can do they're going to die because the antibiotics no longer work and i just thought that really got me oh yeah yeah <laughs> um, I, I, that's I, such a scary thought and it's happening already i mean the, the there's already um uh the latest data which came out a few weeks ago five million people a year are dying from uh antimicrobial resistance and that is a huge huge number of people um yeah. Yeah. Well, it, there's just so much that, as you say, that comes out of a film like this. And Alex, you're making this film as I don't know if we're still in COVID or post COVID or if we're in the pandemic or post pandemic, but there's still people dying in, in America. We're, we're just counting the days before we get to a million deaths. The the cases are on the rise now as, as your film opens. The, the case is the BA2 variant. Does that, how did that play in your mind as you're preparing this film that you hope would, I, you know, document Alice's story, but also document the times and the times show, you know, a failure of science in some respects to control this, this pandemic. What are some of your yeah. thoughts about that? the coincidence of this coming as your film comes out. Yeah, well, it was uh, bizarre, really, because we started in around October 2019. Mm. So before um, news of the emergence of COVID and then obviously COVID um, 
broke and uh, so the film had to sort of switch um, from being just kind of a warning to also a reaction and uh, it's been really frustrating because actually one of the things we thought when we started when COVID came around was actually maybe by the end by the time we've made this film the film will be irrelevant because everybody will be talking about this stuff they must be because of the extent of the problem and so I'm just really shocked that here we are um, a few years later and um, our film's only just about to come out and still no one's talking about this stuff in the way in which they should be. And what we're seeing with COVID is all the firefighting is happening because it has to happen because the problem is here and now, um, trying to find vaccines, getting people off and on ventilators. Of course, you've got to do those things. Um, but we've and governments haven't been focused on saying, well, okay, should we do something about making sure this doesn't happen again? Because look at the devastating impacts that it's had, not just on the obvious things, you know, people dying, but also um, people's careers, people's uh, mental welfare. And the fact that still after all of this, um, no one's kind of addressing the root of the problem, that's um, even scarier than COVID itself, I think. And um, particularly when you look at the predictions coming out of the um, major health organisations in the world about uh, what's potentially around the corner if we don't sort of heed this warning. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, depressing that we're not talking about this stuff and I hope that the film can serve as a catalyst uh, to at least get people talking about this stuff. Yeah. Well, well, Alice, you're the, you're the doctor, you're the veterinarian. Uh, this idea of that we, I guess it's suspected that the, the virus began perhaps in a live market, perhaps in a lab, but some kind of jumping of species, you know, it, it, it's still not clear where we're going to point, point the finger. But mm -hmm. if we continue on with the kind of farming we do, it, it may not cause the, the COVID-19 virus, but it could cause a lot of lesser viruses or lesser diseases. Or how, how do you see it as a veterinarian? And what's the alarm you sound? Yeah, I uh, first need to say that it could cause a lot worse than COVID-19, like the, looking at the sort of mortality rate of COVID-19 of about is it 3%, something like that. Um, there are avian influenzas that have had spillover events with 60% mortality, um, which, you know, if they mutate in a way that they spread as fast as COVID, that's 60% of people that contract the disease are going to die. Um, so that's one thing to say. We never quite know with viruses how they're going to mutate. The um, pathogens mutate all the time and share genetic material with other pathogens. So you just don't know how they're going to come about. Um, and the only thing really to do is pre to prevent that. So looking at wet markets and, and what we've done really in the West is just sort of point the finger over at uh, China and, and um, where wet markets are. Uh, but actually, if you look at the conditions on wet markets, they are very similar to the conditions on factory farms and in slaughterhouses over here. Um, you know, you're thinking how much you're stressing the animal. They're in close confinement with many other animals, both dead and alive. You know, you get a lot of dead animals on farm um, you get cannibalism. You get opening of body cavities and exposure to um pathogens internal pathogens and external pathogens um, and you have this sort of unnatural interface between people and animals um, whether that's in a market or on a farm so all these conditions are absolutely prime for disease to arise and then you think like the number of animals shoved into one space that is so many different immune systems for a pathogen to like learn how to evade it or spread quicker or you know it just gives such a, a greater opportunity for um, disease to arise and then pass to humans because we're then walking into the same airspace that we're exposing ourselves to their feces and urine and um, blood and then we're eating them it's it's like an absolute nightmare from a disease perspective um, so we really can't just kind of look at that in China and wet markets and say oh that's their problem there is also no such thing as elsewhere now like you can't point the finger elsewhere and think it's not going to affect you because as we've seen with international travel and you know things like imports exports of animals it could be 
around the world in a matter of a week. Like, there's, everyone needs to be thinking about this. And can we have better control of this if we limited the amount of factory farming we did, or if we at least did what we did in factory farms better, like uh, in terms of the way the population is put together, or the um, better laws to prevent some of the things that you're describing that would expose uh, disease to, to humans? I don't think there would be, there certainly would be no way of completely eliminating the risks. Um, you're still going to get disease. It doesn't matter how few kind of farms are doing it. You're still, it's still the same risk. Um, and you always are going to have to have an interface between humans and animals. You can't completely eliminate that. Um, and there's no, I just don't think there's any way of exploiting an animal against their will and slaughtering them that isn't going to cause them stress and associated disease and, and require, you know, like pharmaceutical treatment to support them, whether that's hormones or antibiotics or, you know, anti-worm medication, that sort of thing. Um, you cannot eliminate that. And, it, you know, I, I was going around a lot of factory farms, but I also had a lot of uh, smaller independent farms, free range, that sort of thing. Um, and you know, some of those were worse from a disease perspective. <laughs> it really, it didn't eliminate the risk at all. So, in some ways, the end of medicine really means the end of doing the kind of farming and the kind of processing of animals that we have come to know. We have to end that if we really want to survive. Yeah, I think um, looking beyond agriculture, just any way that we exploit animals causes difficulty for us in some way, whether it's, um, you know, going into the, into the wild and destroying habitats, that's creating disease risk for us as well. If it's uh, fur or, or leather fashion trade, that is another way of exploiting animals and putting them in unnatural situations, uh, testing on animals for cosmetics, all of these issues where we, are using animals for our own gain against their will and their natural, you know, lifestyles and wishes is, uh, is going to cause problems for us in, in some way or another. Yeah. So Alex, when, I, I mean, really you were, we talked at the beginning about this idea, end of medicine is being so dire, but it really is more like the end of the way we approach animals, the way we approach our foods, the way we approach how, how foods can be more therapeutic. The positive side is we need to change in that way, I guess. It's the end of animal husbandry, the way we know it. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that's why um, when I, because um, I didn't come up with the title, um, the title was, I think, Keegan Kuhn's idea, who uh, was producer on the film. Uh, who people will know from Cowspiracy and What the Health. And I thought, uh, is it a bit dire of a title, you know? Uh, and then the more I thought about it, the more I did think about how it ha is kind of two-pronged. And it can also mean something really positive, but it's up to us to choose whether the end of medicine, as we know it, means something really bad or means something actually really good. And, and that's the kind of choice that people will have to make and, uh, you know, when they've watched the film, uh, hopefully they'll feel more informed to make that choice. And that's what we're trying to do is not say um, you need to do this or you need to do that, but just to say you have a right to access this information and uh, do with it what you will, but we hope you do this. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I really appreciate you both uh, being here, Alex Lockwood and Alice Brock. Before I, I, I say goodbye to you today, Alice, is there something that you're dying to say um, that I've left out? I somehow uh, have have not touched on that. You want to talk about um, something you did uh, that made you want to be a pig a pig doctor long long ago, or I don't know something that or what you're doing now that that, that is so positive that might so we can leave something uh, positive with the audience. What do you think? Um, let me think about that. That's a tough one. I think you've asked some really good questions and I've, I've said really <laughs> what I came here to say without going into, you know, often I, when I talk about my experience, it's all quite dark and, and negative and 
um, being part of this film has really given me an opportunity to kind of hopefully empower people to think about their own um, their own impact as a community and, and their own choices and it, it, it really is an easy kind of switch to make and I just hope that people make it because there will come a point where we actually don't have a choice anymore you know if we continue the way we're going we won't be able to grow crops to feed livestock we won't have antibiotics to farm them anyway so uh, it'd be great if we could we could get there first without then have suddenly having a massive food shortage because we have to change our systems like on the turn of a coin rather than accepting things as the way they are now and, and taking a uh, taking a step towards the future. Right. Like if only the world would act more logically and more efficiently, then we'd all be better off, I guess. But Alex, is there anything that uh, you, you've been, you're dying to say before I say goodbye that I may have uh, left off? Um, I guess uh, only uh, two things. The one thing I'd say is that, you know, obviously we talk about some uh, dark things, but it's not like a grim watch people don't have to be scared that they're going to see something disgusting um yeah because i think that can put people off it's not um we haven't made it in that way but also uh, i think just to round up i would say that obviously we wouldn't be making this film and putting this message out if there wasn't hope that we could change um you know change things for the better so i think you know we're not kind of like the um the musicians playing on the deck of the Titanic, you know, we we really think that if people heed these warnings and they take this seriously and they go and they do their own research and they make sure that it's accurate research that isn't, you know, funded by um, an organization that stands to profit from that research, then we can really make uh, really positive changes and have a much better future for everyone. So that is, is the aim. And that's how I hope people feel when they've, when they've, you know, watched the film. Well, uh, Alex Lockwood and Alice Broff, thank you both for being on the PETA podcast. The name of the movie is The End of Medicine. And where can they see it, Alex? Is it opening up? Uh, is it going to be on online? Is it coming to a, a theater or what? Yeah, so um, if you're in the U.S. Uh, or Canada, you can watch the film on May 10th on Apple or iTunes. You can pre-order the film. Now, uh, if you live uh, anywhere else in the world, like where we live in England, we're still waiting on a date. So we're going to basically be posting as soon as we know anything on the Instagram page, which is just at the end of medicine. So hopefully we'll have some updates really shortly. So Instagram, no Facebook page? There is a Facebook page as well, actually. Yeah, which is just the same, just at the end of medicine. Okay. Um, but but uh, yeah, so but uh, may, basically may everywhere. May 10th, though, May 10th, they can get it uh, in the U.S. That's um, right. Pre-order on Apple and on... on iTunes, Amazon Prime, um, a few other places, but th those are the main ones, I think, that are most accessible to most people. Okay, great. Uh, well, once again, um, Alex and Alice, thank you for being on the PETA podcast. It's great to have you here. Uh, thanks Thanks so much for having us. <laughs> Dr. Alice Broff is a pig veterinarian in the UK who saw the light and became a full-time animal activist. Alex Lockwood is a film director, also based in the UK. The End of Medicine premieres May 10th. You can pre-order the film on iTunes, Apple TV, and Amazon Prime, among other outlets. And you can go to PETA.org for more. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of the show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at amok.com. Or see my work, my written work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's at ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. 
It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.